Hello. Um, <clears throat> before I begin talking about uh, <clears throat> the movie I'm, I'm going to be discussing today, um, I want to point out that the last uh, last one, um, Interstellar, I said how Cooper, you know, he was a pilot. And I incorrectly said he was a former, he might have been like a former like it was a test pilot or something to that effect. Yeah. Well, he was a former NASA pilot, which obviously should be very obvious since the film's about space or space travel. And that would make sense. Um, maybe there is stuff about the character we don't know. He could have been a test pilot. He could have, you know own jets or something before he became a pi uh, pilot for Manassa, but, you know, we're not told that, you know, he's a widow, um, but, yeah, I pinned a comment, uh, in that video, which basically said all that, but on the off chance, one doesn't look at the comment section there, I just kind of wanted to clear that up here, <laughs> Just kind of right off the bat, I noticed something last night, and all right, like I noticed that, or it came, or I just remember I screwed up. I was a bit tired because it was a little, it was a bit late when I recorded that video. So hope you, uh, <clears throat> hope you will uh, forgive me for that. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let us begin. Uh, with today's video now, or the movie we're going to talk about, which obviously uh, going in chronological order with the Batman films at the very end. So we're not done yet with Christopher Nolan. But we are at this latest film, this 10th film. The film that came out last year and is a year old that I've mentioned quite a bit <laughs> in this series and this channel from the day I saw it until the, you know, the awards, the award shows, the nominations and the wins it the film got and the wins I would have liked it to have got and other nominations and wins could have and possibly should have received if you have been around that long it is um but obviously from the title I mean from the with omitting the Dark Knight trilogy until the very end of this Christopher Nolan series I'm sure you will know it is you know, it's Dunkirk now I love Dunkirk Pretty sure you all know that by now. You know, and I will link uh, the original video I made about Dunkirk in the description and above here, like around there. Those little pop out things, whatever they are. Um, you know, I, you know. I loved it. I love how the timelines of the land or the mole, the sea with the, you know, the land, you know, we follow uh, Tommy Finn Whitehead's character, and we later, and we, uh, Gibson, and then, um, Alex, uh, who's, um, <clears throat> yeah, Harry Styles. Who is Nuren Bernard? Yeah, that's Gibson. I couldn't recall his name off the top of my head. Uh, Kenneth Brenna is Commander Bolton, and um, yeah, the the film. You know, the storyline, 
you know, where the, just showing how what the soldiers on the beach went through, the beaches went through, dealing with dive bombers and U-boats, sinking ships, and dive bombers bombing the beaches and then bombing any ships that came down and, sh and escorted with fighters shooting at them as well, and there's not a whole lot uh, the soldiers could do. You know, a mixture of French and British soldiers, and there were some other soldiers, like there was Indian soldiers on the beach. I know some people were upset that they didn't really highlight uh, those soldiers, but well, the thing was, it was since most of the most of the people on the beach were 300,000 were all British and the rest of the 100,000 most of those were French and then probably divide up how many weren't French but it would seem like uh, some hundred it would be in the hundreds for like Turkish soldiers and so on, like, uh, maybe uh, a thousand at most I could see, but overall it was mostly British and French. Uh, you know, Dunkirk is in France, and right across the channel, or, or yeah, across the channel you could see England on a clear sunny day. Um, you know, that goes on, like, the whole land part, or the mole, is one that goes on for a week, you know, throughout, for, so for seven days, because the Paul Dunkirk event and then the evacuation, all that took place between ten to nine days. I say ten because uh, count nights, maybe you could include, uh, you know, ten. But about that, you know, like a, about like a week and a half or so, these soldiers, 400,000 soldiers, were all uh, were all stuck there with the German soldiers hidden there. Nazis, you know, there's you know they are all falling back. Uh, because they're pushing everybody out to this point in Dunkirk, and um, uh, many British have already had to surrender, and some of the French, and the French were holding the down the front line against the Germans. You know, it, it just was not good. Um, Look at something. Do, 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 Dunkirk. Right. Now I'm curious exactly how many soldiers. Okay. Basically, in the end, over 300,000 soldiers escaped. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to... Just kind of want to double-check on some things. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's just something, something just kind of a uh, question popped into my mind for whatever reason. But yeah, there's like so many people on the beach, stranded, trying to get home, couldn't. And I know some people thought there's some things that you know just couldn't happen. Like, oh well, there's like this huge on the mole, which is Long Bridge. I haven't seen the movie yet, um, or dock or whatever leading out to the sea so people can, like soldiers can get on boats and they can get back home. Uh, you know, they, uh, 
there was like a hole at one point in the very beginning of the film. They were running and trying to get uh, get somebody on a stretcher who was injured onto the boat. Uh, and while they're doing so, you know, they there's a hole with a piece of board lying there. Some people say, well, that couldn't happen, you know. It's, the entire thing would have been broken and blown out, like, in half. They couldn't just do that. Well, a soldier on the, in the behind the scenes, if you watch the behind the scenes, you'll see them talk to actual soldiers who were there. And they said, like, and somebody told something very similar, like, you know, there's like stretchers going across and trying to get get to a boat that was there and it was going there was like this big gaping like hole in the middle of it like the uh, when a bomber came down and uh, a bomb hit and blew out a section in the middle of the like the the mold and somebody put a piece of board so you could walk across it and it was just so things like that, uh, that did happen. Um, there's another thing that happened that I found out about as we go on. But then there's also the uh, the sea portion, um, you know, representing 300 some boats coming across the channel and. Uh, You know, they were just coming across to try and, and just to go and get as many soldiers as they can to go bring back to Dunkirk. Now, what many of these, now not every boat did what in the movie where they get a bunch of soldiers and then they go back to England. Many of these boats, most of them, went across. They got people, you know, soldiers onto their boats and they went to a, like a naval ship. That was some yards out from Dunkirk that were waiting, and then when they would get, <clears throat> and then when the ships would come, the ships would come, they'd have people load up onto the uh, up onto the, the uh, bigger ships, and then from there they would go back to England. Um, perhaps some of those ships would go back and get more people. Um, I'm not 100% sure because the boat we see is based on a boat that did carry a whole bunch of soldiers onto from Dunkirk all the way to um, England. And um, so Brother, one of my brothers watched the movie, and um, he posed an interesting question. Because spoiler, alert, I'm going to just say spoiler alert right now for what happens to a character. But uh, Killian Murphy, who in chronological order, you actually see him before he's truly the shivering soldier. And yes, that is his name listed in the credits. Um, he's shell shocked or has PTSD. Um, Chronologically, when you first see him, it's after a boat. Uh, the main characters were on. They got hit by a torpedo from a U-boat. It sank. They got out of the boat. They're swimming. One of them got onto the boat. Kelly Murphy's in. And the two, Finn Whitehead and Harry Styles, he, they try to get on, but they're told there's not enough room. He almost went over, just coming out, and uh, the one in the boat gives them a rope when they start rowing back, a rope, so when they start rowing back, they're pulled back to shore with them, so they don't have to wait hours until they you know, come back to get them, or they have to um, swim all the way back to shore. 
but he's there. He says the he's very calm and collected. And says, "The state savior strength will be back for you. We can't go. We can't go all the way out to up to England in this weather and this because the water is too rough and all that." He's very calm and collected in that, but because it's out of order, you know, they go back and forth as a normal film often does with different timelines. Um, and I'll just say this now, so I don't have to say it for later or possibly forget later. The reason why I, it seems as if that happens in this film with the timelines different is or are, are all different. And then by the end they all come together is because like when soldiers are talking about something in a specific war, they talk to different people who are there, they all have different perspectives. You know, even if so many of these things that are going on as they're telling like their story of whatever war they're in or a battle, um, you'll have so many different people talking about the exact same uh, battle or war or situation they're in, it'd all be different. Like, this was happening here, yeah, but for this person, all this was going on. And maybe this person doesn't know that. Then there's another person, they have something going on that neither of those two know. Um, it's something like that, where they're constantly going back and forth because everyone's, everybody has different uh, interpretations of what's all happening, even if it's happening basically simultane simultaneously. It, you know, they, um, it goes back and forth because everyone's perspective is different. Uh, now with that said, when we get back to, in chronological order, when you then see Kelly Murphy next, you know, he's on top of a boat, you know, he's shivering because it's cold, and he's like the last survivor of this ship that he's sitting on top of with a, like a blanket and he's it's later revealed that a U-boat uh, shot and sunk the boat and he is really visibly like he's shaken up by it he's just like he's not in a very good state and what later happens is you know, he's locked into this little cabin downstairs by the, uh, Mr. Dawson's son, Peter. Uh, Mr. Dawson is, um, played by Mark Rylance. And he's accompanied by his son, Peter, and his friend, George. Um, now, George wasn't initially supposed to go, but he wanted to because he's like, he thought he wanted to help him be be of use, and also wanted just to say he had done something, because he didn't feel like he's really done much of anything, like at school or whatever, or anything, so, you know, to him that's like, this is his moment to do something, you know, do something meaningful, and help out, so he's there, and He's wondering if, like, killing Murphy is he a coward, and he says uh, he's shell shocked. You know, he's not himself. He may never be himself again. Um, and now he's in this cabin to relax, have tea, and all. And at one point, he wants to get out, but Peter locked the door to the cabin. And as he wants to get out, and his Mr. Dawson tells him to unlock the door. They're all there waiting to see um, what's happened. And the whole thing was, with, with that, um, you know, he's told, you know, Mr. Dawson tells him, because he doesn't want to go back to Dunkirk, I could go there, they'll die. He says, uh, tells him, like, we'll plot a course to go back to England. Meanwhile, he's not going to do that. You know, may have a job to do to get people off of Dunkirk out there and go back to England so 
that's all going on and you know he go, he's kind of like flipping out a little bit he doesn't want to go back but they're going anyway and he says they should go back he says no they have a job to do and kind of go back and forth and then he tries to get the wheel from Mark Rylance and as he's struggling to I get him off the wheel and to keep keep course and go where they're going. You know, George is there. He's near or, or below deck or that cabin he was in, Killian Murphy was in, and you know, trying to calm the guy down and just him stop. And as it happens, he Killian Murphy actually. Like, hits George and he falls and hits his head and later on it's like you know he has a concussion because the hit to his head is so severe you know uh, Peter goes down and he's trying to make him comfortable bandaging his head putting his head on a life jacket and making sure that you know he's comfortable and tries to tell him I'll be okay and then that he and then George later says he says when Peter says you know he needs him back up deck when he's you know is able and he's fine again he says and he can't he says, what? He says I can't see you know he has a concussion because you know the brain is swelling to the point where his eyesight is not there anymore um, and Killian Murphy obviously then feels horrible about this you know my brother asked, like, what was the point? Because also he later, George later dies. And he goes, what was the whole point of that? I don't under. He didn't get that. My brother didn't understand that. And I'm like, you know, I thought about it because I really didn't think much about it. You know, I just enjoyed the movie. And it's like, it's just one of those unfortunate scenarios that could possibly have happened. And I think what Christopher Nolan was trying to do was show PTSD at that time because not many people knew. PTSD, I mean, yeah, it was called shell shock at that point. Um, but I guess he wanted to try and give it a an, exa an example of back in those days of what could have possibly happened with a soldier they find out after a, a traumatic experience of having being like the only survivor of a ship being torpedoed and they're just there alone and then you get picked up by people like oh uh, people are here oh. it's, it's, you know this is great and um you know then to find out that they're going back to the very place you just went we're trying to get away from and with all these explosions and stuff going on you know It's not a very good thing to ha uh, be involved in. You know, war is not good. Um, it's not good at all. And I think what he was trying to, Chris Ronald was trying to do, was show, like, possibly an early example of what PTSD would be like. Just also how fast it could be. You know, it's not just something that ha might happen over time. Like, oh, once everybody gets home from the war, that's when PTSD, you know, like kick in. It's like, no, it can kick in as it's going on. You know. It, it, it's it's not good. And uh, I feel that was what you know, Christopher Nolan was trying to do. Show an early example of what PTSD was like in that situation. Um, because it can happen pretty quickly. Um, and I feel like he got that kept her that very well and and you know for the boat part you know uh, timelines are all interconnected and then it comes to the air part you know with the spitfires with Tom Hardy as Farrier Jack Loden as Fortis 2 or uh, Collins um, Tom Hardy as Fortis 1 and Michael Caine as Fortis leader who you don't see but you hear and um, what they're all doing is 
shooting down German fighters and you know uh, Lou Kwok and the sky and um, Tom Hardy shoots some bunch of fighters down and uh, shoots a Heinkel that's about to drop bombs on various boats. Um, and I'd say I think the air scenes are probably like some of my favorite of the film. It's just like, the aerial battles and everything, the dog fighting is just just so uh, I don't know. You get so immersed and just it's so great. And um, that was a thing that this movie was supposed to do. Some people complain it didn't really tell you the story of Dunkirk. You know, it didn't follow just one person. Because the thing is, there's different perspectives, you know. There's the perspective of those soldiers on the beach. There's the perspective of those on the boat. And then there's the perspective of those in the air, the fighters, the, the pilots. And all these timelines come together at the end. And that was the whole point, to show all three of these perspectives culminating into one moment and then there you go um, and I think that's that works really incredible incredibly well and I think that's what makes I'll probably make a, this film stand out amongst many other war films because Christopher Nolan does say this is more of a suspense film uh, like a suspense thriller per se not just exactly a war movie I mean but it is a war movie takes place during World War II, you know, so in that regard, yeah, it is a war movie, there's warfare, however, it is, a, it is fairly suspenseful, um, and, uh, it's so incredible, I, I just love this film, um, now another thing I want to talk about is the very end, when Farrier, he, you know, he shoots down the last, uh, Uh, Heinkel that's dropping, you know, dropped bombs and like sinks a boat, and everybody has to get off, and its oil is in the water, and it's just not good. And then boats come, and boats come, and, you know. Uh, Mr. Dawson's boat's there, and they're getting people, having people to get on, covered in oil, and trying to get it everybody on as many people on board as they can before the oil catches fire and then the Heiko comes around and um, there's only one Spitfire at the very end of that point because uh, Jack Loden's character Collins he gets shot down he like shoots one German fighter and then he gets shot by the other one and Tom Hardy basically makes sure the one Heinkel can't drop any bombs over a minesweeper. And then, from the perspective of the boat, of the sea part, we then see uh, Collins trying to get out of the... Uh, <clears throat> trying to get out of the, you know, plane because it's stuck and he can't get out. Um, and then here comes... The, Mr. Dawson and suddenly the sun breaks open the window for him to get out and then he helps get people on board. And the very last person they get on board is Finn White, his character Tommy. Um, and, um, and probably one of the most emotional parts of the film is um, when you see all the little boats come are coming and uh, help everybody to get people onto their boats to, and just to get everybody out of there. And that's one of the best moments in the film as well. Um, it's very emotional, very impactful. Um, and with that, you know, that all happening and the I guess one of the last things I want to say is uh, regarding again after Tom Hardy shoots down Heinkel, which falls and crashes into the oil and then you know, sets fire. And 
and that sucks, but it's like, it seemed like it was either gonna, you know, it, I guess it could have been a much worse situation there. Um, but it's like he had to shoot that down, because otherwise it's like, I don't know, it just wasn't, it wasn't a very good situation. Regardless, I guess, since the aftermath was, it hit the oil in the water and caught fire. Um, but he runs out of fuel, because he's been running out of fuel, because he can't see his fuel gauge, because it got, he got hit a little bit, and it got knocked out, or he couldn't see it anymore, like, read it. And he runs out of fuel. And he's gliding over Dunkirk. And as he's doing so, people above, they, or people below, they see this. And then, as he goes past the mole, we then see, we then hear a familiar sound as the dive bomber is coming. And uh, Kenneth Branagh and everybody looks up. They prepare to... <clears throat> be bombed, and then Tom Hardy comes back and shoots it down, and then it crashes in the water. Now, some people say that's impossible. Like, it's impossible that a Spitfire could glide after it ran out of fuel, which it actually couldn't, you know. Which it actually could, <clears throat> I should say. Spitfires could glide for 15 miles, and Dunkirk Beach is uh, 20 miles long. And if you've seen the movie, you obviously know, spoiler alert again, he lands the plane. He lands the plane on the beach, he then sets it on fire, and he's outside of the, he's in the enemy territory, he's out of the allied zone, and he it's also to boost morale as why he doesn't ditch out what he could. Like, he's over his soldiers, he's far enough away that he could ditch out, but a couple things is morale support, to keep morale up to everybody on the ground, because many people on the ground didn't think the RAF were very helpful, because not many people saw Spitfires in the air or any other British fighter, um, because they had to save all the fighters and everything, or most of the fighters, and fuel for the Battle of Britain, which would happen like in the coming months. Um, so, saving fuel and sending few fighters, fire squadrons, at a time, with fuel for an hour, 40-minute fighting time, over Dunkirk, so they have a total of 20 minutes to get there and get back to refuel, possibly. If they're not going to send out a couple others, and then just kind of go back and forth, do that. Um, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, they, um, so that was one th reason why, and also another reason why he didn't ditch out um, is because, you know, he was too low. The altitude was very low. Could have been very dangerous for him if he jumped out and parachuted. Because he might not be able to parachute in time. And, um, yeah. And the other thing is uh, him shooting down an air enemy aircraft in the air while gliding. Um, but I did read somewhere where there was a documented where. A pilot in a Spitfire. He came to Dunkirk, gliding, and as he was gliding, here comes a German aircraft. I think it, I can't recall if it was a just a normal fighter or if it was a bomber. But regardless, sees an enemy aircraft and he lines it up when it's what he. When he would be able to, or when it would be in a sight, and he fires and it shoots it down. So that happened. The thing with Dunkirk and all the stuff that might be a little 
seem implausible is these things did happen at some point. Um, Nolan talked to surviving soldiers who were there at Dunkirk. He read about Dunkirk. This has been a film he wanted to make since back in 1997 when he and his wife uh, went from sailed from England to Dunkirk and back. It was supposed to be an afternoon, but they said they went around that same time of year. I believe, and the waters were incredibly choppy. And they, like, left at 5 in the morning, and then they got back at 1 in the morning the following day. It was an entire day, basically, of just going across and coming back. And they said, and for what everybody did... At Dunkirk, all the little boats, people who had the little boats, went over and came back. Right, they just gave them a lot more respect. So he was really fascinated. Really wanted to make a movie about this, but he needed he needed a studio budget. But he had to do a whole bunch of things, make a bunch of movies to prove he could tackle anything he wanted. And he later did. No one did his research. He made a fantastic film. <laughs> I think it deserved more accolades than it received. But, you know, that's just uh, me. Uh, I think it should have won Best Picture and Director. Would have liked it to see Kenneth Brenna and or Mark Rylance get nominated for Oscars and won winning. Would have liked to have seen Kenneth Brenna win, you know. He's a great actor and director. He deserves uh, an Oscar, in my opinion. But Mark Rylance was equally great. Everybody was great. Everybody who worked on this film was great. <sighs> that was quite a bit. I didn't intend to exactly go on like this, but I really love this movie, as you all know. And I think it's incredibly... It's very well done. This was like basically my retrospective, like one year later. Like, do I think Dunkirk holds up? Yes, I do. It wasn't like just a fluke thing, like for like, like that year. I thought, oh, it's really great, and then rewatching it a couple more times. Oh, it's not that great. Uh, I loved it when I saw it in the theater. I still love it now, and I'm sure years from now when I rewatch it, I'll keep loving it. Um, so you know, yeah. I don't really know what else to say. I basically praised it and kind of delved into the plot. <laughs> Spoiled it for anybody, but then again, it's been out for a year. I'm sure many people have seen it who wanted to. But maybe I piqued your interest, I don't know, by talking about this. <laughs> maybe I haven't. I don't know. But all I can say is uh, I enjoyed it. If you've seen this, hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, um, and to have a good day, really. Just have a good day, have a good week, and I will see you all later. Bye.